hello everybody. My name is Peter Hilton and I'm going to talk to you about what code looks like. Um, I promised earlier that I'm going to reveal what I think is the greatest mystery in programming. It's the end of the day, this is something slightly different. I'm not going to teach you anything useful. Hopefully you've learned lots of useful things already today. Um, what I want to do is to make you think a little bit differently about your code and realize that there are some changes that we could consider making to our code. The reason I care about this kind of stuff is that I care about whether code is maintainable. I care about the difficulty and cost of maintaining code. So recently I've done training courses on how to maintain code. And one of the key observations, one of the key realizations when you start looking at code maintainability is the fact that we spend a lot more time reading code than we do writing code. And so as programmers, when we look at how we write code and the tools we use, we focus on the writing and we often neglect the reading. So what I'm going to talk today is all, all about the reading. Before I was a professional programmer, when I was at university, I was involved in um, something else. I cared a lot about, I learned a bit about type. Not type as in type system, but type as in typewriter. So typewriter technology has a lot to do with what our code looks like. So first, a short digression. What is this? This is the IBM Selectric typewriter that was introduced in 1961. This is a pretty fancy typewriter. It was advanced at the time because it had this sort of golf ball sized print head, golf ball print head that you could remove and replace it with a different one. And there was a choice of 45 different typefaces in two sizes. So this was a typewriter, desktop typewriter, that let you use multiple typefaces. Now, one of these typefaces was a new typeface that IBM had commissioned for their typewriters. And that typeface was Courier. Courier is a compromise. It's a compromise for typewriter hardware. Typewriter hardware has these limitations where the characters have to be the same width. Also, the definition on individual characters is kind of bad on a typewriter because of the way it works, you know, striking this inked ribbon. So the, the serifs, the, the corners of the letters had to be very exaggerated and the letters were quite wide. It works, but as far as typography goes, it's pretty ugly. Of course, this is in 1961. Meanwhile, at the time, code did not look like it was typed on a typewriter. It looked far worse than that. Code came out of line printers, fairly illegible, um, appalling, and, and there's nothing to do with typography going on here. This is just um, technology focused on getting the stuff on paper as quickly as possible. Uh, readability was probably not a priority. So I guess line printers, they were a great crime to typography, even more so than typewriters themselves. Um, this is a COBOL, by the way, just in case you're trying to figure it out. Now, later on, Courier was widely used for source code, especially when printed on paper. Um, and this is, I guess, partly due to Windows 3.1. So when Windows 3.1 was released, Microsoft had commissioned a new typeface for Windows 3.1, and that typeface was called Courier New. Courier New is yet another compromise, this time for a different technology. So on Windows 3.1 font rendering, it needed to work on low resolution displays. Monitors at the time were kind of tiny and square and horrible. At small sizes, at small font sizes, the strokes needed to be one pixel, not one and a half, not two, um, to, to be legible and to be clear on the screen. So this meant that all of the strokes needed to be thinner. So that's why the, the strokes on Courier New are thinner than on traditional Courier. Um, it's what we'd call a, a lighter font weight. Unfortunately, Courier New, being fixed width and a default font on Windows, started to get used for code a lot even by non-programmers. Now, Windows 3.1 was a long time ago. 
a really long time ago, decades ago, and yet it's stuck. And so I guess the low point, my, the typographical low point of my career as a programmer was when this otherwise excellent book about a Scala web framework that I co-wrote with two of my colleagues was sort of semi-spoiled by the fact that all of the code examples used Courier New. And I argued with the publisher, I begged for a less ugly typeface, but apparently this was not negotiable. And this is an appalling choice for print, because it's really wide. So the worst thing about doing this project was that all of the code samples had to be limited to 55 columns. Now, I like long variable names. Now, if I liked single letter variable names, then maybe 55 columns would be enough. But this was altogether a fairly painful experience. And the horrible irony is that Courier and Courier New were compromises for typewriter technology and low resolution computer displays. Print publishing does not need those compromises. There is no need to use this deliberately compromised typeface in print. But for some reason, you know, the habit got there with the publisher, the habit stuck. And that's a problem for all of us as programmers. Our habits have stuck. And so, you know, we still often write code and present code and read code as if it were written on a typewriter. Now, this is, you know, we got this far at Windows 3.1. So there are more, uh, there, are, there are other ad advances in typography that we've applied to code since then. We got more than just a new typeface. So what's happened since then? Um, in, well, I guess television's got color in the 1960s or something, um, or maybe in the 1970s if you couldn't afford one of those, or a bit later. This is a 1969 uh, Sony television. Um, apparently it was uh, very advanced in its time. Later, so that was the 1960s. In the 1980s, we had these kind of ancient home computers. Uh, as a kid, I had one of these. This had color, but it wasn't until much later that we got syntax highlighting in code. I'm not sure when the first text editor or IDE had syntax highlighting. Don't know if anybody knows. I mean, I didn't see it until after 2000s, um, but apparently Vim had it in the 90s. In 98, Vim introduced syntax highlighting. And so what we have here is almost the pinnacle of typography for code. We've got a yet another new typeface, Consolus, uh, which was developed to, show, to use a new font rendering technology in a newer version of Windows. And we have color, and we have italics and bold all together. Um, incidentally, this is quite an interesting piece of code. It's the fast inverse square root calculation. Um, you can find this on Wikipedia. It does something clever with uh, um, calculations used in 3D graphics. Yeah, it's just a nice bit of code because it's sort of interesting. And it's got this very weird magic number in the middle. What's going on there? I don't know. Anyway, there's more. So this is what most of us use. But relatively recently, I discovered something quite new. And maybe not everybody knows about this. There's another innovation which ironically is not new outside programming. I mean, this is as old as it gets in printing, but now we have ligatures. So in traditional typography, ligatures are when you get letter combinations, and if you were to print these two letters next to each other with the right spacing, they would get in each other's way. And so you have separate glyphs, technically, for these combinations of letters. So the TH on the right is a separate glyph that's repla that replaces the separate letters when you use them so that they join together nicely. Um, and some of these are fairly obscure. So the FJ combination, which combines the dot from the J with the lowercase f's ascender, um, this doesn't come up very much in, in English at least. Um, as far as I can tell, fjord is the only English word that has FJ. It's probably more useful in Norwegian. But typefaces you know, that you use in your word processor typically have quite a few of these letter combinations. So it's not a new technology thing. But it took quite a while before somebody had the great idea of applying this to code. Here's the announcement in 2014 of um, a new typeface called Hasklig. Hasklig was designed for Haskell, 
based on an existing font called Source Code Pro, and it would render the ASCII art of Haskell at the top in a slightly more mathematical way. So Haskell is this programming language by mathematicians. And mathematicians tend to kind of like symbols rather than words, which is why Haskell programmers never want to use more than one letter in a variable name. And the Haskell looks a bit more like the mathematics it represents if you have proper arrows, um, for example, or a not equal sign that's actually an equal sign with a bar through it. So this is made possible by the ligatures. When you type the equal sign and the greater than, your editor replaces those two characters with the ligature. And the result is pretty nice looking. And it's no longer fixed width, um, because if it had to be fixed width, then the combined character would be too small. So that's kind of interesting, but it turns out, I'll come back to this, it turns out that your computer does not crash if you write code in a typeface that is not fixed width. Who knew? Remember that, remember that for later. Um, now, Haskellig was specifically designed with Haskell in mind um, and has lots of characters that occur there. Later, um, a more popular, ver more popular ligature coding font called Fira Code was introduced. So it takes it further and it's got lots more kind of interesting ligatures. So, I mean, this is from the, the, the website for Fira Code. But what I'm showing on this slide is that it's based on a font called Fira Mono, but it does some sort of interesting ligatures. And some of them are quite funky, like the join together www, um, or the HTML comments. I think that one's particularly good. And some of them are very subtle, um, like the, uh, the hash symbols joined together, or the X in hexadecimal numbers. That's slightly different from a lowercase x. So this works not in every tool, but these days, this works in quite a lot of text editors. So time to put your hands up. Who's using one of the fonts with these kind of ligatures for code? Okay, now that's great, because this is less than 10% of you, and that means that 90% of you have a great treat in store, because you can download Fira Code, it's a free typeface, you can set it as your default coding font, and uh, your code's just gonna be so much more cool. I mean, it's still not going to work, but it's going to look much better. Um, do this. Do this immediately. Do this tonight before you go to sleep. Um, this will... Because, the, you know, the file on disk is exactly the same. The, you know, and if you, if, you commit, if you do the pull request in GitHub, it's still the same characters. It's just the way it's rendered on your screen when there's typeface that changes. So there is some innovation in typography for source code. Um, so to summarize... Well, there's not very much. And the thing is that typography, um, you know, the design of what letter forms look like, I guess is three to four thousand years old. And in 60 years of coding, we've got a couple of new typefaces and color and ligatures. So I'm not very impressed. We could have so much more. So... What I wanted to do now is to kind of take you on a journey of imagination. What could we have? And I want you to think about why we don't already have this and what it would take to get something different. So I mentioned that Courier and Courier New were guided by the technology. There were hardware constraints um, that affected their design. Now, hardware changes. So these days, we're more likely to um, you know, read our code on some fancy desktop setup. It's got, you've got to have at least two monitors, you know, um, preferably three. Have as many monitors as possible. Absolutely a good idea. Um, and when you add more monitors, you tend to add them sideways. And monitors are getting sort of wider. And so you have this kind of great horizontal canvas filling your field of vision. This is as it should be because your field of vision is wider than it is tall. And so when you've got enough monitors and you sit at your desk, you can only see code. That's what you want. And let's suppose you're a Java programmer working with some code base. And I suppose you sort of know that methods and functions should be short and that classes should have a single responsibility 
But you also know that in practice, you're going to open your Java class in your editor, and that class is going to be this shape. Um, this is real code, just like really small. And that's not even all of it. This is only the first eight or 900 lines, I can't remember. Um, this class had several thousand lines of code has several thousand lines of code. Actually, I made this slide a while ago. It's probably got more than that now. Um, an exercise to consider as a thought experiment. How many classes in your code base are, say, longer than a thousand lines long? I mean, be honest. Maybe, maybe work out how to do this on the command line. We have lots of this kind of long, tall code. And so the rest of the space on our widescreen monitors, it's more or less wasted, which is a shame. So, well, we don't really waste it. So we have IDEs that kind of chop it up into rectangles. This is the bento box user interface style. And we put other interesting stuff there, like our debuggers and our code browsers and our project browsers. But it would be nicer if the code used the space a bit more. So, OK, so bear with me. What could we do? Well, we could have another column. Just a thought. Like, if we put the code in columns, you get more of it on the, on the screen. And, and if you run out, because this is still not the whole class, but it's more of it, you could continue on the next screen. So I guess what would happen here is that you would scroll sideways. It seemed like a good idea until I looked at this and then realized you'd never find your place. It's a bit messy. So I thought I'd continue with this. I thought, what if you could use more than one font size in the code. I mean, nobody's ever tried this, I think. But I don't know, maybe that would be OK. So you know, pull out the, the, method, you know, the method signatures, highlight them a bit. Because there is structure in the code, so maybe we should be able to see that. Now it looks messy, and it's also got a funny alignment. But we can tidy that up by drawing some lines. If we draw some lines you know, between the columns and horizontally between the methods, then we sort of divide it up a bit more. We've got a bit more visual structure. So this is the sort of the layout part of layout and typography. Of course, what I'm doing here is I'm just copying newspaper design. So this is what newspapers have been doing for a very long time. Um, yes, this is from the spring source code. It, it, it seemed like an obvious choice. Although I had to find a class name that fit. So, right, so I've reinvented, or, or more accurately, I've blatantly copied newspaper style layout and typography. So, what this means is that we've reached the level of layout and typography of edition one of the Oxford Gazette, which was the very first newspaper published in England in 1655. Yes, this typography is 360 odd years old, and yet we haven't thought of doing this in the code. What if? So let's just go back to the monitor thing, because I showed this photo of the monitor. And, uh, and I was in a shop recently, and they had one of these. It was this sort of monitor that just went on forever and ever, sideways. And I was looking at this, thinking about code, obviously. And I was thinking, well, it, it, it says it's a gaming monitor. But it turns out that some of them can rotate. So then you could actually have like lots, lots more lines of code. Yeah. Okay, so we have, you know, our technology is giving us some, some opportunities here. Now, all that was really about was fairly basic layout, as I say, newspaper style layout. So what else, what else might we do? Now, the, the thing about text and typography is the context matters. What kind of text is this? Is this a telephone directory? Is it a poster? Is it an advert for a gaming monitor? What we need is a sense of style that's appropriate to the context. Now, it turns out that the code I showed you earlier is used in 3D graphics routines. It's used, for example, in Open Arena, which is a Quake 3 clone. Something to do with calculating reflections and you know, geometry. So 
what if the code had a little bit of the aesthetic of a computer game, like this? So then I started thinking about what could I do? Okay, what, what changes could I make? Well, I could change the typefaces. I could choose something a bit more interesting, a bit more modern. I could have a color scheme. Like I could have a theme, not my editor theme, but what if the theme was specific to the code? You know, in the same way that if you go to a shop and they have magazines, they're not all the same color. Um, and there's various things. So I already showed you the idea of headers and columns. Um, and, you know, and you could highlight things. And so I played for a while with that code, and I ended up with this. And it's the same code, but it's just you know, doing something a bit different. In particular, it calls out the massive weird magic number in the code. And the comments, which nobody reads anyway, I've heard, I mean, they're pulled out to the side, so they don't you know, get in the way of the main flow of code. The same code presented differently. This should be a poster on the wall. If this is the most interesting code in this code base, it shouldn't be buried in a text file. It should be at least A0 size on the wall. And this doesn't have to be automatic. It's okay to do it manually, to make the code more readable. After all, we spend much more time reading it than writing it. I mean, apparently this particular algorithm dates from the 1980s and has uh, gone through lots of reuse in different systems. Anyway, I'm only playing here because I've never worked on computer games. Um, I've spent much more time building business applications, internet applications that put things into databases and get things out of databases. Less exciting, I suppose. So having worked in a more corporate environment, I realized that I should have a different way of presenting corporate code. Corporate code maybe looks a bit more like a company's annual report. And so I'd have a, you know, a big photo at the top, a moody stock photo, and, um, and, and spaces in the name, because you, know, you should be able to read it. And so what I've done here is that I've got some documentation comments at the start in black, the, the metadata, the license stuff that's less interesting on the side. Um, and I've started using color in a more interesting way in the code itself. Okay. So this wasn't hard to do. It's not that I'm a designer. I haven't done anything fancy from a design point of view. But already, this is way different from what code normally looks like. And we end up with columns. I have one more sacred cow to slaughter. So I mentioned it earlier. We have high resolution displays now. If you, if you look at it on a retina display like this, or these sort of new high res monitors, then you can see the letters, the individual letters very clearly. This means that it's no longer necessary to have fixed width typeface. You could just use proportional spacing. Not even because it's less ugly, although that is a good reason all by itself. Because the thing is, um, type, typography is also about usability. It's also about readability. One of the differences between different typefaces is how quickly and successfully and accurately you can read text. There is a good reason why you don't have novels set in weird typefaces, and especially not in Courier, because they would just take longer to read. It would just be less usable. And so as long as you don't have technical limitations like low resolution, then um, proportional typefaces are easier to read. Fixed width is just a thing of the past, really. And it's kind of weird, actually. Remember that fixed width um, text comes from typewriters. But when is the last time anybody saw a typewriter? As, as programmers, we've preserved this sort of technical constraint from decades ago. Whereas everybody else, they got word processors in the 1980s and, and, and WYSIWYG text and, and got away from it. So strangely, as programmers, for some reason, we've 
not embraced newer technology. We're, in some sense, still stuck in the 1960s. I think somebody tried to ask a question about tabs, and I'm not going to go there. But actually, it's, it's, it's a good digression. The whole question of tabs versus spaces misses the point entirely because it's a question of layout. How do you format the code? How do you do horizontal layout? And it's what we call a false dichotomy. Should you choose this terrible choice or this terrible choice? The answer is no. Both of them are wrong. In every other typography, if you're designing a banner like this banner here, and you want the logo to be a bit further to the right, you don't insert a space or a tab. You just move it a millimeter to the right. So we shouldn't be using characters for layout. That's just horribly primitive. That's how you do layout on a typewriter. On a typewriter, your options are spaces or tabs. On a computer, you should, have, you should be able to do anything that you could do in, say, scalable vector graphics or PostScript. So neither, neither tabs nor spaces. Does it compile? I don't care if it compiles. This is for the poster that goes on the wall of the room we work in as developers. This is, this is a separate version of the code for reading. You know, the one the computer has that, you know, maybe that's just still the text file because we've got these tool chains that are limited to working with text files. What we need, what we need is a, um, a designer on every coding team, a graphic designer who will, on a weekly basis, take the most interesting code that we have and um, make a beautiful infographic style poster representation of this code and stick it on the wall as a learning material. Now, you might think that that's kind of a waste of time because it's manual and that code will change and then you'll have to do it again. But consider that if you work for a product company, you have a marketing department and there are designers working for the marketing department making brochures and posters and leaflets and things, adverts, which are thrown away after weeks or months. But we keep code for years. So why don't we have designers on the coding teams? Um, I'm probably wrong, I'm just not entirely sure why. So come and see me afterwards and see if you can talk me out of this idea. But the, the more important thing is that I believe that code could have better design, specifically better typography. Um, but that's not the way it's going. You know, reality is either moving in a different direction or it's just completely ignoring this. So people are still kind of arguing about how to do layout on a typewriter and not thinking about what if we could do layout in, a, in, you know, in the way that you lay out even the most simple newsletter using um, a word processor, for example. It's worth watching this presentation, if you haven't already, by Brett Victor. Who's, who's seen this online or in person? It's called The Future of Programming. Okay, this is even better. I see only four or five hands. All of you are going to Go home, and before you go to sleep tonight, watch this talk on YouTube. Um, it's much better than the one you're in now. Um, but it's, and it's got some very important ideas in it. Essentially, he pretends that it's 1973, and he says, all this really great stuff happened in the 1960s, and in the future, it's going to be great. He says, I'm totally confident that in 40 years, we won't be writing code in text files, because that would be really tragic. It would be really tragic if in 40 years' time, we hadn't come up with anything new. But for some reason, we're, we're stuck. And so he talks a bit about why we might be stuck. Watch the presentation. But I said on the previous slide, reality is going in a different direction. So I'm thinking about you know, poster-based layout and typography, getting a designer to, to do stuff. But I don't really expect that we're going to get a designer in the development team. To, um, to make our code beautiful. Although that is a shame. That would be very cool. What, what I am seeing, though, is new kinds of programming, which let's call them visual programming. And I've got a couple of examples here, starting with Scratch and BPMN. So while programmers, conventional programmers, 
using mainstream languages, continue to ignore typography, there are some new technologies built by non-programmers or either outcast programmers for people who don't identify as programmers. Um, and they're not stuck on typewriter style in text files. So I want to just briefly show you that there is some stuff going on that's different. So the first of these um, is business process model notation. This is um, an object management group standard for business process diagrams. Now this is designed for process analysts, operations managers, um, and it kind of represents the steps in a business process. Meanwhile, completely different audience, there's Scratch. Who's seen Scratch before? Okay, a lot of people. So Scratch is, is far more well known and probably more popular than the process notation. Um, so Scratch obviously is, if you don't already know, Scratch is a programming environment designed for children. Um, I, I suppose you could say that BPMN is Scratch for managers. Um, in, in many ways, they're, they're very similar. They allow you to represent basic programming concepts visually. So you can do things, you can do things one after the other, a sequence of, of what would be consecutive lines of code in, in Java. Um, you can do conditions, like an if statement, and you can do loops. So with these kind of basic constructs, you can do procedural programming. The difference between the two is that Scratch, which is designed for children, is way more sophisticated than BPMN. Uh, go figure. Now, there's a couple of interesting things about these. Not least that they're visual and aren't constrained. They don't use fixed width typefaces. Um, but there are things that you get when you start doing things visually. So if you zoom out on the Java code, it's entirely uninteresting, um, apart from the, the value of feeling a bit guilty when you just see how long your class really is. I don't know, maybe we should be made to print out our longest class and stick it on the wall just to make us uh, care a bit more about refactoring. With the process notation, if you zoom out far enough that you can't really read the text, you can still see some overall structure. It still tells you something a bit useful. You can still understand um, some high-level things about the structure of a process, especially if you draw it in a certain way. I mean, you have some flexibility with the layout, um, but for example, at the top, on the left, there's three things that happen in parallel, and the visual representation shows that to some degree. In Scratch, you also have some freedom of two-dimensional layout. You can move blocks and put them in different places. And when you zoom out, you can't read the text, but in this Scratch program, you can still see the colors. You can still have some sense of the, the structure of the program from the visuals. And that's something that we're very good at as humans, is recognizing visual structure when we look at a picture. Because these things are not based on text files in the same way as traditional programming languages, there's some other cool things you can do, such as um, do things in multiple languages. So this is useful for children because you, know, you can't assume that they speak foreign languages like English. And so Scratch is localized into different languages. So you can just select a different language for the keywords. So this means that you can have Scratch in Polish, for example. I think this is super cool. Um, Scratch also has this sort of uh, development environment. Um, so Scratch turns out to be real-time event-based programming um, with a visual debugger. I mean, that's already fairly sophisticated. That's one sense in which it's more sophisticated than, um, than the, the process model notation I showed you. And, you know, these environments allow relatively complex programs. And although it's, let's say, just for children, it's quite popular. So if you go to the Scratch website, you discover that, actually, in, in the, it's built into the IDE. On the top right, there's a couple of buttons. They're quite small. And, and one of them, it's the, uh, I think it's the orange button on the top right next to the longer blue one. It says share. And so sharing stuff online is built into the environment. 
And so if you go to the Explore page on the Scratch website, it tells you that there are 31 million projects. Um, apparently, GitHub has like more than 60 million repositories. So you, you're not necessarily going to be impressed by a mere 31 million. Um, but it's just children we're talking about for the most part. You know, not professional programmers, you know, churning out JavaScript frameworks. So Scratch is kind of popular. Doesn't feel constrained by conventional typography. More importantly, it's aimed at a different group and it's a different kind of programming. It is quite tempting to dismiss it as not real programming. To think it's not real programming because you couldn't build, I don't know, microservices with it or something. Um, but it wouldn't be too difficult to use those ideas and apply them to different problems. And also, it's worth remembering that every time there's been a major shift in how we write code in the history of programming, um, the people who had established skills always said, that new thing is not real programming. So when Fortran was introduced, the people writing assembly code, they said, well, that's not real programming. Assembly language, that's real programming. But if you go back further, when assembly language was introduced, the people who were writing machine code in binary, they said, well, this assembly language, that's not real programming. Beware of saying that something is not real programming. Because a whole generation of children is growing up with this. So when they all graduate from their computer science degrees, do you think they're going to be content writing Java in, in Vim or in Eclipse or IntelliJ? They're probably going to invent some kind of enterprise scratch. And I have no idea what that's going to look like, but I'm pretty sure it's not going to be text files. Um, I discovered another visual programming language recently um, coincidentally, um, yesterday I sort of finally got to kind of look this up on the website and discovered that this thing, which is the Luna language, um, comes from a startup that's based in Krakow, just down the road. So I actually went and visited the founders and had a chat about this. So this is interesting because it has this visual representation of values, assignment, and function calls and data. So the circles represent values and the um, the lines represent calls, but it also has a parallel text notation, which is a functional programming language um, inspired by Haskell, but designed to be less difficult to use. And these parallel notations um, are sort of in sync in the editor. You have a, a split screen editor. Now, this is a very simple example. This is a slightly more complex example. And already it starts to show that you can do things that you can't do easily when you're working with text. So it doesn't show all of the same information, but it allows you to view different things. So there are different types. It's a type-safe language. These are represented by colors. So I can't see which type is which immediately, but I can see that the t where, where the types are different from each other. Also, it allows visual debugging. So some of the small, the, the blue numbers at the bottom here um, these, are these are parts of expressions, um, and there's a kind of visual debugger where you can punch in values and adjust them in real time and see how other values change. If you plug this into web services, you might see the, the JSON response from calling a web service you know, in one place, and then the result of querying that JSON somewhere else. Um, this is very interesting. This is you know, a kind of a new approach, and there are not very many of these new approaches. So just to repeat, these kind of innovations are often pursued, invented by people who don't call themselves programmers. Um, I work a lot with um, operations managers and people working in businesses who are using process model notation. They do not consider themselves to be programmers. But these are the people who you know, do all the fancy things in Microsoft Excel. And so I've seen non-programmers who are, for example, typically Excel users, maybe somebody who works for an insurance company with a finance background, build sophisticated, complex um, business processes that are executable, that they can run. And what they've done is that they've programmed some software. And it's not very sophisticated. It's quite limited. But they did it themselves. 
And they can be very successful, although intriguingly it's important that you don't call it programming. They don't, they don't realize that they're programming in our terms. We would just look at this and say, oh, that's programming. But they don't call themselves programmers. So part of what's going to happen is increasingly we will see visual programming tools that are not called programming, but will solve problems that in the past you needed to use things like Java to solve. So this sort of brings me to my, to my final point, if you like, illustrated by the humble punch card. So this is an 80 column punch card. Now even I am not old enough to have actually ever seen one of these for real, but you know, I've heard that they existed and I found this photo online. And as I understand it, writing code used to mean punching holes in these things and feeding it into a machine. I guess you were probably doing machine code in binary for some particular machine. That was programming. But it would be ridiculous to suggest that you would actually use one of these today or program that way. It would be a horrible experience if you're used to typing code into an editor. So that makes me think a bit about the future. You know, we have discussions about languages. Um, COBOL is still widely used because lots of organizations don't know how to kind of migrate those systems and they're too scared to touch them. Uh, we have this realization that one day Java, you know, may be this sort of legacy language because nobody wants to use it because we've all switched to something newer and fancier. And we're often arguing and having kind of um, evangelical conference presentations about whether you, we should all move to Haskell or Scala or Kotlin or JavaScript or, or something. But in some sense, all of, those, all of those arguments and discussions entirely miss the point because all of those programming languages, the conventional programming languages, they're really just variations of Lisp and Fortran in text files with tool chains and technology that doesn't allow us to do any kind of interesting typography and layout. So we've just got variations on old programming languages that look ugly on the screen. So we should not worry about whether our languages are going to be the COBOL of the future. We should worry about whether the text files that we save them in are just the new punch cards. And that this whole notion of kind of writing code in files is the one that's going to go away. Because maybe that next generation of kids who are learning Scratch, you know, the future inventors of enterprise Scratch, they will turn their nose up at text files and they don't want to program the way we do. And, and there will be, you know, we'll be, we'll be saying to grandchildren, well, you know, when I was younger, we used to kind of type in these editors and it was just typing. Um, you know, using some kind of typewriter. I mean, these are kind of not pleasant to type on. You know, if you're used to a computer keyboard, like you really have to put in a lot of effort to move these keys. It kind of hurts your fingers. I mean, it's useful if you're learning to type because you've got a lot of feedback. But, you know, modern keyboards don't move very much. So, to wrap up, although it's interesting to think about different ways that code might look and how we might present it and to ask questions like, what if we had designers to look at, to, to design posters for our code to stick on the wall? I mean, that, that, that stuff would be kind of cool. Um, I think the more serious point is that code in the future could be really quite different to how we currently have it. And we, as programmers, as an industry, would probably do well to figure out why we're so stuck in the past. Because I can't think of any other use of text in modern civilization that has no typography in the same way that source code does. The closest I come is that Hollywood film scripts have to be written in Courier or a similar typeface. But actually there's a reason for that. And they're quite specific about the typography. It has to be a certain kind of typeface in a certain size. So actually that's more attention to typography than we get for code. So if you think of any other place where we really kind of, you know, publish and read text for important things that we spend lots of money and years on, uh, please come and tell me. Shout. <laughs> okay, documentation written by programmers. Um, RFCs was the, 
Yeah, so they're horrible to read, and I highly recommend looking at the HTML formatted versions, you know, the ones that allow you to have more than one typeface and more than one font size. Um, so that's almost like a counterexample that just proves that I'm right. Um, another, another potential example of use of fixed width texts are those um, flight booking confirmations you get. Um, sometimes they're in a sort of you know, fixed text, fixed width uh, format. You sometimes get these by email. But I think that's only because they come from some reservation system that was written in the 1970s that still hasn't been replaced. Anyway, so don't expect kids who learn to code on Scratch to be happy with the stuff we use. And uh, don't worry about you know, being put out of work later in your career because you use an old programming language. Um, worry that you're just using the completely the wrong paradigm at all. And, and look for new things. And, and maybe please invent some new things. So that's all I've got. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. <laughs> it's the end of the day, so go and enjoy yourselves. But um, strictly speaking, we've got a few minutes left. Um, come and ask me questions uh, or tell me I'm wrong. If there's anything you'd like to disagree about, I'll stay here for a little while. So thanks for your presentation. So w what's your take on literate programming? You didn't mention that, but it's actually, I think, at least in part what you want. You, you, you write code and in, liter in a literate programming system and you can extract nice... Do you want to come over here and ask questions? Because I need to back up. I'm not a fan of open Q&A. <laughs> 